You can open your Bibles to Luke chapter 24. The 24th chapter of Luke is the last chapter in the book of Luke, and it's the same chapter that we looked at last week. We're going to look at a different section of that chapter, uh, but last week, you'll recall on Easter Sunday, we started with the first 12 verses and just kind of unpacked uh, a little bit about what the empty tomb, the significance of the empty tomb, particularly for the women uh, that found the empty tomb and what it was that... um, that it communicated to them about the resurrection of Jesus. Well, today we're going to conclude this series. This is week number seven that we've been in Luke, and we've been looking at particularly this idea of what does it mean that Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. And so we've been trying to unpack from a number of different stories, beginning in Luke chapter 9, the various ways in which the author Luke presents Jesus as the Savior of the world. And so if you have your Bible, I'd like you to turn to Luke 24. Uh, And if you don't have a Bible, you can surely use the one on the screen behind me or use the one in the pew rack uh, that's right in front of you. If you use that one in the rack, you'll find this text on page 885. I'm going to read from verses 36 down to verse 49. You can stand with me if you'd like. You don't have to, but you may. Luke 24, verse 36 says, As they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they thought, excuse me, but they were startled and frightened and thought that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See, my hands and my feet, it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and he ate before them. And then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Father, I pray that as we look in this text that what would be true of the disciples that day would be true of us as well, that your Holy Spirit would open our minds to understand the Scriptures We pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I've entitled this message, That the World May Know, That the World May Know. Um, When I was a a freshman in college, I went back to Chicago to Moody Bible Institute, and uh, as I was enrolling, I got there late because of a mishap with my application and the waiting list and all this stuff, and I got there late, and I was registering for classes. It was a typically hot, humid, muggy August day in Chicago, and I was in shorts and a t-shirt and sandals and was going into the administration office trying to get all my classes and everything worked out, and I was getting hungry, and so I went went down to the cafeteria to get some food. And as I was standing in line and getting ready to go into the cafeteria, the person at the door said, I'm sorry, sir, uh, you can't come in. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're dressed in shorts and sandals and those aren't allowed inside the cafeteria. I thought, well, that would have been really helpful to know. That would have been a helpful piece of information that would have been given out prior to me going down and being embarrassed in front of everybody and being sent away to go put on long pants and a collared shirt in the middle of August. I just, I didn't understand it then. I'm not sure that I do now. Think about this statement, though, and the title of this message, that the world may know. And the question that I have for all of us here this morning is, what does the world need to know? Could you take just 30 seconds and either talk to the person who's sitting next to you or consider in your own mind, what is the message that the world needs to know? Go ahead and talk for a second, and I'll call you back in just a moment.
Any of you who cheated and said, well, the message that the world needs to know is the gospel, we got to go a little bit deeper than that. It's true. The gospel is the message that the world needs to know. But what it, particularly about the gospel, this good news of salvation through Jesus Christ, what is it that we need to be able to say about that? What do we need to understand about that? And I believe that this text helps us to look at this question and answer it with four different words. And you're going to see these words throughout the sermon and maybe even on the screen behind me. In fact, there they are. Peace, presence, power, and promise. Peace, presence, power, and promise. If the message of Luke, the author of the book that we've been studying, is that the audience of his book would come to see Jesus as the one through whom salvation ultimately comes, then he's going to be very intentional about how he concludes his letter, his book, his account. He wants us to see in a picture or in a conversation something that helps to summarize the larger message of his entire book. And I believe that in this account that we just read, we can see something of a message that the world needs to know about peace, about presence, about power, and about promise. Look at the text with me again, beginning in verse 36. As they, the they there is referring to Jesus' disciples, as they were talking about these things, the these things that are being referred to there are likely the resurrection accounts that have been coming in throughout the day. For Luke 24, from beginning to end, is a story about the resurrection day, Easter Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the dead. And the way that Luke breaks that story up is in a morning, afternoon, and evening kind of a scenario. We looked last week at the morning, verses 1 through 12. Early in the morning, the women before dawn took the spices and went to the tomb to be able to prepare the body for burial. And they find that the tomb is empty, and they're startled, and they're afraid, and they go back and they tell the disciples, and we left last week with Peter running back to the tomb to see for himself. The story then in Luke chapter 24 moves from that account to a time when Jesus is interacting. It says later that same day, Jesus is interacting with two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Emmaus being a small village enclave away from Jerusalem. And these two disciples, not named among the twelve, but rather followers of Jesus, are leaving Jerusalem somewhat dismayed by what has just taken place over the last couple of hours as they have seen Jesus crucified. They've waited on Sabbath day because they could not travel back home. And now on Sunday morning, they're going back home and they're discussing these things. Well, as you read the account, and we're not going to take time to do that, a man appears among them who we come to find out is Jesus himself. And it says in that, in that text, in that interaction, that the men are asking questions about what has happened, and Jesus reveals himself to them as the resurrected Jesus, and that concludes by them saying, did not our hearts burn within us as he sat with us and talked with us and had a meal with us? And it says that he was revealed in the eating of the bread and in the drinking of the cup. And then there's an evening account, so morning, afternoon, and evening, and the evening account is the one that we've just read that starts here in verse 36. And in this evening account, now there is the word is getting out, if you will. If they had social media, uh, Jerusalem Twitter would have been blowing up at this point, uh, that, that something is happening. There's, 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 a, there's a rumor that is spreading, and we need to figure out what this is about. What is going on? The women have given account that there's no one to the tomb. Peter has gone to the tomb. There's no one down there. Now these men, after they have had this interaction with Jesus, actually go back to Jerusalem. It says they go back to the upper room where everybody is waiting. And uh, in John's account, it says they're actually behind a locked door for fear of the Jews, thinking that they would be next. And they're, they're getting these reports. And now, all of a sudden, they're talking about these things. Verse 36. And all of a sudden, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, 
peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought that they had seen a spirit. Yeah, no kidding. They know Jesus died. Confidently, 100%, no doubt among them that on Friday night, Jesus died. They watched him, his body be laid into a tomb. They watched the stone be rolled over the tomb. They went home Friday night dismayed and sat Saturday, the Sabbath day, in their sorrow. And now here on Easter Sunday, things are beginning to change and all of a sudden, that which they have been hearing about is now standing right in front of them. It doesn't say that he knocked on the door. It doesn't say that he, uh, that he sent a note saying, hey, I'm on my way. Uh, it says that he just appeared among them. And again, from John's account, from through a locked door, he just appears among them. And they were startled. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they, I would be too. Oh, wait, we're, what is happening? We, we can't get our mind around what is happening, but look at Jesus' words. This is what I want you to see. Jesus' words are very clear here. Peace, be still. Peace to you. Peace I bring you. When Jesus enters a room, peace enters with him. And the peace, the peace that Jesus brings with him is the shalom of God. Now, what is shalom? Shalom is a Hebrew word for peace that talks about completeness or wholeness or settledness. That all of the dismay, all of the disruption, all of the worry, when shalom enters, all of it subsides. All of the agitation, all of the questions, all of the angst, when shalom enters, all of that subsides. And Jesus walks into this situation and he says, peace to you. Shalom to you. May your hearts be settled. I find this really interesting because John, or excuse me, Luke, the author of this text, uh, opens the story uh, in Luke chapter 1 by talking about the kind of person that Jesus is going to be. I've put the text on the screen for you. You can write down the reference or you can go there in your own Bibles. But Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 76, this is actually a man by the name of Zechariah who is prophesying now about his son, John, who would be raised up to be John the Baptist. He was the cousin of Jesus. And as Zechariah is prophesying about his son, look at what he says. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways. This is how Zechariah is foreseeing his son's ministry. To give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God. Whereby, watch this analogy or this picture that Zechariah paints with his words. Whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high. That picture of the sunrise is the, is the advent of Jesus, the advent of our Savior, the advent of Messiah, this new day that is coming. The sunrise will visit us from on high, and it will give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, and it will guide our feet into the way of peace, into the way of shalom. This Messiah is going to be prepared for by John, but he's going, to be, he's going to be just the foreshadow of this sunrise that's about to happen, this new dawn, this new day, this new awakening, and this new day is going to cast a light on the dark places. It's going to cast a light into the shadows, and it's going to illuminate for us the way to shalom, the way to peace the way to wholeness, the way to rest. This is how John is prophesied. This is what Luke wants us to see. And now at the very end of the story, when Jesus enters, 
he says to his disciples, peace to you. That which has been prophesied, that which you have been preparing for is now here among you. Jesus, in John's gospel, in John chapter 16, verse 33, says, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. When Jesus is on a boat with his disciples and there's a storm that is raging and he's sleeping at the bow of the boat and they go to wake him up, what does he do but stand up and look at the wind and the waves and say, peace, shalom, be still, rest, know that I am in control of everything. And when Jesus enters into this upper room to his agitated and angst-filled disciples, the first word that he has for them is settle down. And some of you this morning come to church agitated, full of angst, questions, There's things that are happening in your life. There's things that feel out of control. There's transitions or movement for you or for your family. There's futures that feel unclear. And I believe that today, God, through his son Jesus, wants to say to you, peace. Just settle down. I'm in control. I'm in control of all things. The wind and the waves listen to me. So will your troubled heart if you open your ears and your life to me. Peace. God's desire is for his people to live in peace. And when there is turmoil in our lives or there's turmoil in our homes or there's turmoil in our workplaces, that is not the plan that God has for our homes and for our families and for our lives. He wants us to live in his peace. The second word that I want you to see real um, uh, illuminated throughout this text here is the word presence. The message that the world needs to know is that Jesus' presence is real. And so look at verse 38 with me. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Seems an unfair question, doesn't it? (laughs) I mean, based on what they've just walked through this last week, um, it seems a little bit of an unfair question. And I think it's a little bit of uh, of a leading question that's meant to help them to see, in light of everything that has just gone on, I want you to see how, how my presence is here with you now. See my hands and my feet that it is I myself, touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. Yes, I've just shown up in your upper room. Yes, I did not knock. Yes, I'm standing here in front of me, but go ahead and look at me. If you want, you can touch me. You understand that what you're looking at is flesh and bone. This is not a vision. This is not a mirage. This is not a spirit. I am not a ghost. I'm a human. I'm a resurrected human. Which, by the way, just gives me a little bit of an exciting thought about what our resurrected lives are going to look like, what our resurrected bodies are going to be like. If Jesus is but the first fruits of those who have been raised from the dead, are we going to have the same kind of ability to move and transport? And I mean, that just feels cool to me. kind of cruising around the new heavens and the new earth, checking stuff out. I don't know. I get excited about that. But Jesus says, spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when they said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Why would he do that? To show them the nail scars from the crucifixion. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, do you have anything to eat? (laughs) Such a weird conversation. Poof. Ah, it's okay. I'm flesh and bones. By the way, I'm hungry. 
It, the whole point of this interaction is so that the disciples would recognize that what is in front of them is the resurrected presence of the man who they have been following for the last three years. He wanted them to be sure that they knew, that they could see, that they could touch, that they could watch him eat, that he was physically present with them there. Why broiled fish sounded good, I'm not sure. But that's what they had to offer, and that's what they fed him. This is not unlike the interaction that he had just had along the road to Emmaus, where we read in Luke 24, verse 32, that they, the disciples there said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them together, saying, the Lord has risen indeed, and he's appeared to Simon. And then they told what had happened along the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. His presence was there with him, and his presence presence, his abiding presence, was prophesied back in the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 54, verse 10. It says, for the mountains may depart and the hills may be removed, but my steadfast love will not depart from you and my covenant of peace will not be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. There may be all kinds of turmoil happening in the world, but if you are mine, then you are mine, and you cannot be separated from me. Amen. Your presence, my presence with you is sure, and it is secure. Not only is there a peace and a presence, but there's also a power that is demonstrated. Look again in our text at verse 44. Then Jesus said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. There is a power that is on display here that allows Jesus to illuminate for his disciples something of the Old Testament scriptures that reveal who he is. Now, in Luke 24, there are two Bible studies that take place that I wish I could be a part of. One of them is with the disciples on the road to Emmaus, where it says in a very similar way back in verse 25, O foolish ones, Jesus says, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says in verse 27, and then beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things that were concerning himself. Jesus, along with, this, with these two people along the road to Emmaus, as they're walking and talking, Jesus does this amazing Old Testament survey and shows them how he is the fulfillment of all the things of the Old Testament. What an amazing conversation that must have been. And now here in the upper room, just a few verses later, he says to them very much the same thing. The Old Testament, the prophets, the Psalms, the writings, the law, all of these things were fulfilled in me. And then he does this amazing work of opening their minds to understanding the scripture. There's a power that's at work here. And I believe that part of the message that the world needs to know is that not only does Jesus come offering peace and not only does he come offering his presence, but by his Holy Spirit, he comes offering power to those of us who believe. An incredible kind of a power, an illuminating kind of a power, a power that is found in his Holy Spirit. Luke opens the next book that he writes, Acts chapter 1, by saying, you will receive power, verse 8, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses. You will be the ones who give testimony to what I have done. You will be the demonstrations of my power through your words and through your actions and through your deeds and in the ways in which you love and minister to people around you. 
When people interact with you as my follower, they should see and feel something of the power of God in you. Not your own ability, not your own skill, not your own giftedness, not your own uh, expertise in any particular thing, but rather they should see, understand, and feel the power of God at work in you. The promise is that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You know what that word is in the Greek, witnesses? Martyr. I didn't know that until this week. But the same root of that word witnesses is the same word that we get for martyr. When we think of a martyr, we think of someone who's dead because of their testimony about Jesus. But Jesus says, you will all be my martyrs. Not that we will all die necessarily, but you will all testify and be willing to testify about the power that is at work within you. The power that raised me from the dead now becomes your power. What a beautiful gift. And to a world that is oftentimes looking for answers and reasons and ways in which they can interact with life that feels out of control, how good it is to know that the Holy Spirit comes offering his power. And not only his power and his presence and his peace, but also a promise. Verse 46 says, And Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, The Christ should suffer, and on the third day he would rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, or you are martyrs, again, there of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The promise of Jesus clarifies what our purpose is here in the world. And if you look at the rest of the New Testament, our purpose is made pretty clear. It starts with preaching repentance and baptism in Jesus' name. In fact, Peter, one of Jesus' disciples, in his very first sermon in Acts chapter 2, Peter stands up and he says to the audience that is listening to him, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. The primary thing that we are called to do, the primary promise that we are called to, to expound upon to the people around us is that there is a way to forgiveness of your sins, and it's found in repentance and baptism. Now, how beautiful was it last week to see Nine people get baptized and, and to be able to say, this is, this is who Jesus is to me. This, he is my Lord. He is my Savior. I want to follow him. But that move towards baptism starts with repentance. And repentance is not merely a feeling. Sometimes we think of feeling, uh, repentance is a feeling of guilt or a, a feeling of, of, of um, uh, as though I've done something wrong or shame. But repentance is really an action. It's an action that says, I'm going to change my direction. I'm going to change my mind. In fact, the process of repentance is change your mind in order to change your heart, in order to change your attitude and your actions and go in a completely different way. It starts with acknowledging that what I am pursuing is not the right direction. I need a change. I need to go in a different way. This world, the pursuits of this world, the things that I think will please me in this world, the things that I have made a God of or an idol of, the things that I place up here as of highest importance, they actually need to be lowered and I need to instead see Jesus as the point of the story. I need to acknowledge him, I need to worship him, I need to pursue him. In doing that, that's where peace and presence and power and his promise can be found. It starts with repentance. It moves to equipping the saints. Corey helped us to see so well at the beginning of the service today the the purpose of, of gathering together and equipping the saints to do the work of ministry. Attendance of church is not enough. Coming is not sufficient. 
It's a good starting point. But the goal of coming is to be equipped so that you can be sent, so that you can do something, so that your gifts, your skills, the the Holy Spirit in you can be a blessing here in the church and out in the community as well. We repent of the direction that we're going. We're baptized in the name of Jesus. Our sins are forgiven. We become equipped to serve the body of Christ. And then ultimately, we worship this God who has made all of this happen. Hebrews 12 says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that, we, that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God our acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. This promise, the promise of God's presence, the promise of his power, the promise of his peace, the promise of the fact that if we are his witnesses and we are faithful in the call that God has given us, that we will have the opportunity to call people to repentance, that we will be part of equipping the church for the work of ministry, and that we will give worship to God. And oh, what a beautiful thing to see this place as a gathering of worshipers every Sunday that we gather to collectively worship this God who saves us, that we gather in this room to hear stories, to hear prayers, to hear testimony, to hear from God's word about the things that he is doing among us and to give thanks to him for the salvation that he offers through his son, Jesus, that the world may know this message, this peace, this presence, this power, and this promise. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that you would shape in us a message of repentance and a message of hope. Father, may we be a people who are not shy about declaring to the world its need of Jesus. And may we who are looking for peace, may we who are looking for your presence find it in Jesus. May we be settled in your rule over our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you stand with me as we're dismissed? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you, to be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance among you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day.